So um, it's my pleasure now to introduce um, Sarah Caulfield. Uh, she's the founding uh, and artistic director of uh, Consonair Choral Community. She is an experienced conductor, singer, and music uh, educator who strives to interweave the teaching of vocal pe uh, pedagogy into the choral experience. Sarah has directed choirs for singers of all ages, range of abilities, and in a number of settings, which include church choral programs for children and adults, teaching middle and high school, collegiate choirs, adult community programs, and now at the professional level. With a supportive group of musicians, Sarah embarked on the creation of Consonair, Choral Community in 2018. I love this, to explore building community through choral music where she directs uh, choir matrix and voices of consinity. In addition to managing the organization, Sarah holds an MM in choral conducting from UConn with extensive graduate study in choral conducting from Cal State University in Los Angeles. She obtained a BA in psychology from Cal Poly Pomona where she also began her studies as a music educator. And she currently sings with two professional chamber choirs, uh, Collegium, Ancora, and Alchemy. So I wish that Sarah had a more impressive uh, resume that I could read, but this is what, <laughs> she's amazing. And it's really my pleasure to introduce Sarah to you now. Sarah. Thank you so much, Donna. I didn't realize you were gonna read the whole thing, but anyway, thank you. Um, I would like to um, welcome everyone to this wonderful conversation today. We are very uh, fortunate uh, to have Donna Berman from uh, Charter Oak Cultural Center being a part of sort of fostering us through this discussion and hosting us for our performance next week. So I wanted to thank um, her directly for um, just the wonderful support and her encouragement for us to have this wonderful conversation. So the concert is Stars Are For All Who Look Up. And we are kind of discussing today, are the stars really for everyone who looks up? Does everyone have equal access to seeing them, experiencing them, and having a chance to sort of engage in the awe of looking up at a night sky, unhindered, as it were. So we have a wonderful set of panelists. We are going to start with Sharon Lewis. Uh, Miss Lewis is a lifetime Hartford resident and executive director of the Connecticut Coalition for Economic and Environmental Justice, an organization that was established in Hartford in the summer of 1997 in response to community concerns regarding the siting of a power generator in South Hartford. The mission of the Connecticut Coalition for Environmental Justice is to protect urban environments in Connecticut through community education, promoting changes in state policy, and promoting individual, corporate, and governmental responsibility towards the environment. She has stated that improving human health and the environments of low income communities of color is our work. So Sharon, if you can just give a quick wave so everyone knows where you are, that would be great. Next up, we have Dr. Meredith Hughes. Uh, Professor Hughes studies planet formation by observing the disks of gas and dust around young stars using radio interferometers. I don't know what any of that means. I am completely in, just in awe. Uh, she has joined the faculty at Wesleyan University in January of 2013. Dr. Hughes is a current member and past chair of the American Astronomical Society Code of Eth Ethics Committee and has been involved in many equity and inclusion activities in astronomy, including the AAS Com Committee on the Status of Women in Astronomy, Wesleyan's Women in Science Group, and as an organization organizer of the inaugural Inclusion Astronomy Conference. She is also a lifelong amateur choral singer, so that's pretty exciting. So we're happy to have you here, Dr. Hughes, if you want to give everyone a quick wave with your um, assistant in tow, I see. <laughs> Next on our panel, we have Dr. Anthony Tracek King. Over the past 20 years, Dr. Tracek King has cultivated an international reputation as a choral conductor, scholar, pedagogue and media personality. He is passionate about cultivating artistically excellent ensembles that explore socially relevant issues through emotionally immersive programs, challenging both artists and audience to feel and think. Dr. Teresa King has recently been appointed as both Associate Professor of Choral Music and Director of Choral Activities at the Hart School at the University of Hartford and a resident conductor with the Handel and Haydn Society. He is also the conductor of Unitas Ensemble, which will be collaborating with Voices of Consinity next week for our concert in Hartford. 
And lastly, we have our moderator who will be helping drive the conversation today and the discussion. Um, Miles Wilson Tolliver, um, he's a fabulous bass baritone and, a, and he's an award-winning opera singer, arts advocate and voice instructor. He specializes in 21st century operas, world premieres, new works, and operas dealing with social justice. Off stage, he is the executive director of Miles and Friends Mentorship Program, curator at Redeemer's AME Zion Church, teaches voice at Harvard, and is the founding director of Voices of Hartford Ensemble. All right, I'm going to pass it off to Miles and say again, thank you everyone for being here today. Hello everyone, it's so wonderful to see your beautiful faces and to feel your spirits here with me right here in Hartford. I am so excited to begin this discussion and I'm honored to be here Thank you so much, Sarah, for having me and Consonare, as well as the, um, the um, Charter Oak Cultural Center. I'm really excited and thank you for hosting this, this uh, conversation. Um, today, we are breaking down the barriers that block people of color uh, and some uh, protected classes from experiencing and enjoying life. Open skies, stars, nature, and the beauty of this world are for all, but are they? Are stars for all who look up? Um, Consonate Choral Community, uh, again, just wanna say thank you and for being willing to have this discussion. Um, my name, like uh, Sarah said, is Miles Wilson Tolliver. I am, but I am here, and she said a whole bunch, right, about my, my work, but I'm here as a Hartford resident. I'm here at, uh, as someone uh, who has been in the Hartford community all my life, and I am here as a Hartford kid, most importantly. Uh, a Hartford kid who had the opportunity to look up at the stars and dream. And, and made something happen. Um, so I'm really grateful to be here. I may not have all of the answers when it comes to astronomy <laughs> and environmental justice, Ms. Sharon Lewis, but uh, I'm really excited to, uh, but I'm really excited to facilitate this conversation and I'm honored. So without further ado, I think we should get started and jump right in. Um, why don't we, first off, we'll ask the panelists. We have uh, Dr. Anthony Tressa King with us. Uh, we have Dr. Meredith Hughes, and we have Ms. Sharon Lewis. Why don't we uh, go through our panelists and just talk a little bit about who you are and uh, what you do. So we'll start with uh, Dr. Meredith Hughes and uh, her assistant explorer. <laughs> Sure thing. Thanks so much, Miles. Um, so I am, uh, this is this is my son, Leif, he's three, um, and I am a professor and associate professor of astronomy at Wesleyan University. And um, so what that means is that I divide up my time between um, research, where I'm trying to discover new things about the universe and planet formation, and teaching, where um, I'm working with students on our campus, training them in scientific skills, and also teaching gen ed classes to people who are not going to go on in science, but who uh, you know want to fill their science requirements for the major? Okay. So we have um, we have another component, which is um, we do a lot of outreach at the observatory. So I've also been involved in uh, kind of stepping up our outreach program at the at the Van Vleck Observatory at Wesleyan University. And um, I also, uh, one of my particular interests in teaching is that I've introduced into the curriculum at Wesleyan a lot of. Um, ethics and equity and inclusion material. So some of the questions that I think about a lot with my students um, in my classes uh, and in, in all of the work that we do at the observatory is this question of who gets to do astronomy, right? If you look at the professional, at the demographics of the field of astronomy, who, uh, who is represented, who is overrepresented, who is underrepresented, and why. And so, you know, if that's something that you're interested in, we can certainly talk about some of the landmark sociology studies that get at some of the factors for why people are underrepresented in astronomy. And um, 
Then there are some other issues that come up when we're talking about the ethics of the night sky. Um, one of the real topical issues right now in astronomy is where do we build telescopes and whose land are we building, building telescopes on, right? So um, of course the, 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 big, um, the big one there is Mauna Kea in Hawaii, which um, is on indigenous land, right? The observatories on Mauna Kea are on indigenous land and there've been a lot of protests in recent years, um, largely by the indigenous community in Hawaii um, because uh, there are conflicts between um, the, the uh, use of the land and the cultural beliefs um, and, and also simply the history of access to those observatories. And then finally, another one that comes up a lot these days is um, the launching of these new satellite mega constellations by SpaceX, which really changes everybody's view of the night sky, right? And, and so then you get into this kind of ethical and also legal question of, who, it, who owns the night sky, who's in control of the night sky and who gets to decide whether corporations can launch mega constellations that we will all see in our night sky and we can already see in our night sky um, all around the world. So, uh, so those are some of the questions that I talk about with my students and some things that I'm interested in discussing tonight. Wonderful, and you've just completed my job. So thank you very much. <laughs> just kidding, <laughs> I'm not. <laughs> Dr. Uh, Dr. King, uh, I'm really excited to hear. Uh, who are you and, and what do you do, man? Well, you know, thanks. It's a great honor to be here and it's great to be talking with you, Miles, and to, to share this panel with Meredith and Sharon. And, and, and Meredith, um, you have like a really planet formations. That's just cool. Um, I have nothing to like, so I'm going to be doing a lot of listening during this during this discussion. Uh, but uh, as Sarah said, uh, my name is Anthony Teresa King, and I'm uh, the new professor of choral music at the Hart School. Um, uh, and one of the things that I've been always interested in is the intersection between music and social change and social justice. And and so a lot of my research has been in that area and in crafting concerts that kind of speak towards specific issues and whatever those issues may be. Um, uh, and a few years ago, uh, you know, my wife's a biologist and, and, and we crafted a, a concert together, which we did discuss uh, species extinction um, and all the things that that kind of play into species extinction and, and through music and a narrative, if you will. And one of the pieces that uh, we brought in was um, Stars by Eric Eschenwaltz. Uh, and we were discussing light pollution on that on that particular piece. Um, and so if you come to the concert, you'll, you'll hear that piece uh, in, a, in a joint performance. Both Sarah and I, our two groups, will be doing that um, with a video that shows the different levels of light pollution. And it's one of those things that when I, when I was growing up, um, I grew up, uh, we won't go through my family history, but North Dakota and Nebraska. And it, it's, it doesn't take very long to get away from city lights in, in those areas where you can actually see like the Milky Way versus when we're here in the the northeast um, the amount of light pollution that is that is there so it's just these things that kind of concern me because the the um when you talk about like who lives in the urban environment you know what's the representation of 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 um who who makes up our cities um there's a, a huge swath of people who aren't aren't able to kind of experience that um and that the great wonder and in fact sometimes you, it's you can only see specific stars and you can't see constellations anymore um, and, and when you think about the history and how the stars were used to guide people, and I think about the enslaved population in the United States to escape towards the north, um, stars were the, a, a great um, guiding map, if you will, to, to get us to that new, new area. So I don't know, I just, I, you know, like I said, I'm in awe of this discussion and I'm just gonna sit back and do a lot of listening, but uh, those are just a few things that are on my mind. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Sharon Lewis? Hello, everybody. My name is Sharon Lewis. I'm the uh, executive director of the Connecticut Coalition for Economic and Environmental Justice. As was stated, I'm, I'm super excited like everybody else. This excitement is so contagious and I just love it. I, I too, um, I'm going to listen and learn a lot and I'm going to maintain communication with all of you guys. I'm very, very excited about astronomy, always been interested in it, uh, never had an opportunity to pursue it for various reasons, which I might discuss later. Um, I'm also excited about hooking up with uh, the two gentlemen who are involved with music and social justice, because in everything that I do, we like to include all types of media and music is the thing that I, in my generation, 
have always listened to the social justice issues. I remember, uh, not remember, but most people, most society at large feels that people of color are not into the ecology, not into the environment. And uh, two years ago in April, I made a presentation to some folks in the energy sector, and they were totally shocked when I played a recording of Marvin Gaye uh, that was made 52 years ago about saving the ecology. A song called Mercy, Mercy Me, the ecology. Mm -hmm. people, have, people of color have always been involved and interested in the environment. So this is one of the things that I like to elevate and make sure that it's always in a very high profile. Um, I uh, am a historian, I'm a storyteller. Um, I love civil rights. I, I, it's, I use my civil rights books as my Bible. Whenever I run into a situation, I refer to something that happened. How should I deal with this? Um, you know, uh, in everything that I do, I, I start at the beginning. There's this West African uh, sort of tradition called Sankofa, which states that it's okay to look backwards as you're trying to go forward. You know, it's okay to look back and, and, and pick up something that you may have forgotten because uh, we all realize that, you know, until you understand where you came from, you're never going to make it to where you plan on going. And that's one of the problems. Uh, you know, people talk about things like critical race theory and things that upset people. But unfortunately, you know, life is not always kind. Life is not always easy. And we in America need to have these upsetting conversations. So when I talk about the origins of environmental justice, I go all the way back to slavery. I go all the way back to the government sanctioned segregation and redlining and major pushback uh, that has kept people of color from enjoying the benefits of a clean environment. So uh, I will stop there because if I don't stop there, I will have nothing else to say later. So <laughs> uh, Sharon, you just keep going, it's fine. We're just all listening. <laughs> Friends, I just want to caution you, make sure you have a notebook out <laughs> because I think, I think we're going to get some really good information this evening and I'm really excited. So uh, as we uh, continue, thank you so much for, to our panelists for introducing yourselves. What I'd like to do is kind of hop on some of the things that you talked about briefly um, as you were introducing yourselves. And I'd like to start um, uh, with We'll just go in the same order. So Dr. Meredith, would you mind talking a little bit about some of the outreach things that you're doing uh, at Wesleyan and what that work is looking like for you? Sure, I'd be happy to talk about that. So um, one of the neat things about Wesleyan's Van Vleck Observatory, which is 106 or seven years old at this point, is that um, it's relatively rare for um, such an amazing observatory to be located in the middle of a city. And Middletown is a city of 50,000 people. And um, so that comes with light pollution issues like Anthony was talking about for sure. But it also comes with opportunities because we are sitting you know, within walking distance of Main Street in Middletown, which is kind of an amazing place. So of course, our uh, outreach has been a little bit upended by the pandemic, like so many other things. But, um, but basically what we do uh, in, you know, what we have done in pre-pandemic times and what we're, we're restarting now is um, every Wednesday night during the semester, we open the observatory uh, to anybody who wants to come in. And, um, and so uh, again, pre-pandemic, one of our students would give a presentation about some cool topic in space. And, uh, and then the telescopes would be open and anybody can go up and look through them. And then at, twice a month, we would have kids nights where um, we're bringing kids kids into the observatory, we have cool, fun activities for them. And um, a class that I have taught for eight of the last nine years at Wesleyan is our astronomical pedagogy seminar. And so um, we're building into our curriculum opportunities for training students in pedagogy. And um, we also, it's, a, it's what's called a service learning course. So we're also going out into the community and sharing um, and, you know, practicing the 
communication skills that I'm teaching them and then sharing their knowledge with the community. So even during the pandemic, we've been doing that. For example, this past fall, we worked with McDonough School in Middletown on one of their project-based learning cycles with their fifth graders on how to help humans live on Mars. Um, we did sidewalk science with the Russell Library where we got library patrons to ask us questions about space. The librarians collected the, the space questions. And once a week for um, five weeks, we went down and the students would, were chalking answers on the sidewalk outside the library with sidewalk chalk. So, um, and then for special events, like if there's a transit of Mercury or, you know, some kind of cool eclipse or something, we'll often set up telescopes outside the observatory and um, just invite anybody who wants to, to come join us in, um, in enjoying the sky. So, um, so again, you know, we're, we're trying to figure out how to start that stuff up safely. Oh yeah, we have an inflatable planetarium that we bring to schools in Middletown as well. That's another thing that we do. Turns out it's not the best thing during a pandemic with a respiratory virus, like packing a bunch of kids into a little inflatable dome, <laughs> but we hope to be able to start that up as soon as it's safe to do so. Wonderful, wonderful. You, you mentioned something very interesting that really caught uh, my attention. Um, you asked the question and you posed the question, who owns the night? I think it was a really um, em empowering uh, realization for me to think, well, wait a minute, I, don't, I actually don't know who, who owns the note. I thought we all um, had equal you know, stake in, in enjoying the night sky. So can you elaborate a little bit on, on that question? Who, and what do you mean by that? Yeah, so, so this concept of ownership of the night sky, right, you can think of it in a lot of different ways, right? There's sort of a, a legal framework, um, and this is something that astronomers have to think about a lot, right? Even, uh, you know, Anthony was talking about light pollution, which we think of as the visible light in the night sky, um, and that affects, you know, not only professional astronomers, but also communities, especially indigenous communities with um, cultural knowledge of the night sky and how they experience the night sky. Um, one thing that Anthony mentioned was, you know, the, the constellations disappearing. And that's certainly something that happens in the Northern Hemisphere, but it's almost even worse in the Southern Hemisphere. We're actually in the Southern Hemisphere, Andean cultures had just as many kind of dark constellations, which were based on uh, dust lanes in the Milky Way, which is something that we don't see as much from the Northern Hemisphere because the center of the Milky Way is in the Southern Hemisphere. But um, indigenous cultures in the Andes had as many dark sky constellations from the dust lanes in the Milky Way as, as star constellations. And so as soon as you start to lose your ability to see the Milky Way, which as we know is very difficult even in central Connecticut, um, then you're you're really losing that uh, the millennia of cultural knowledge that goes along with that. So um, so there's the cultural side of things. There's a commercial aspect to it too. Something that we worry about a lot in radio astronomy, which is my field, is um, what's called RFI or radio frequency interference. So all of the electronics that we love, you know, the way that we're talking to each other right now over Wi-Fi for a lot of us, right? This all produces radio emissions and um, um, and some of that is commercialized uh, in our cell phones and, um, you know, the satellite transmissions where we get, you know, your, your uh, satellite TV signals or whatever, right? These are all things that interfere with our, our ability to study the night sky, to learn about the universe and our place in, our, in the universe. Um, and so there are different... Um, commissions, like there's an FAA commission on the radio frequency spectrum. There's a National Academy of Science panel that tries to do what's called spectrum management, right? And so this is across the electromagnetic spectrum, which is all the different types of light. So not only the light that we see with our eyes, but also other types of light, like radio light that we can use to study the night sky. Um, there are tensions between the commercialization and the scientific aspects um, as well. So, um, and then you can think of the legal side of it also. So um, legally, like how do you regulate low earth orbit? And that was the thing that I was talking about with SpaceX. Um, there are not a lot of existing international space laws that, that regulate access mm -hmm. to low earth orbit, to um, you know the surface of Mars, for example, who decides if Elon Musk can go land a bunch of people on Mars? It's actually kind of not clear from an international law perspective. So there are many different ways that you can think about this concept of ownership of the night sky. Um, and that's, that's just a few to get you started, but I, I don't wanna take up too much time. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, this is going to be really tough. So we're going to, we're going to try to get all of this information packed in here. But I'm actually, I'm actually going to ask Ms. Sharon Lewis to, to hop in here. You mentioned something about the interferences of how um, that block us and the barriers that block us from seeing the, uh, the sky. So Ms. Sharon Lewis, um, I'm going to ask you, you know, um, one of those barriers that you and I have had the pleasure of talking about is light pollution. 
Um, and I'm going to ask you kind of, can you explain what light pollution is and then, you know, explain how it affects us? Well, light pollution is, and is often overlooked because so many, well, in, in the EJ community, because there were so many other issues we have to deal with. Uh, but light pollution is real and it's very serious. Uh, as far as a, a definition, a brief definition would be, uh, light pollution is artificial light that interferes with astronomical observations. That would be a basic dictionary definition. But when it comes to the environmental justice of it or environmental injustice of it, uh, light pollution differentially affects people based upon income, race, and class. It's a definite environmental injustice because light pollution is greater in urban areas and in areas that are primary environmental justice communities. Uh, light pollution not only prevents us from seeing the stars, but it also uh, has serious health uh, uh, complications, health outcomes. For example, it, it disrupts the, the human circadian rhythm, which increases uh, rates of sleeplessness or sleep disturbances. Uh, many studies have shown that it leads to uh, obes obesity and various cancers. Um, light pollution is just something that's not good for us all in general. Our bodies were not uh, human nature or the humanness of mankind was not really developed to experience so much brightness and so many bright lights and it's, it's actually a waste of energy because we use too much. We have too many lights, there's too much brightness, which is another environmental injustice because all this brightness and waste of energy adds to greenhouse gas emissions. You know, fossil fuels are still the main source of energy in the United States and the world. And this contributes to uh, untold air pollution and climate change, you know, BIPOC, the Black, Indigenous, and people of color are first and hardest hit by the vagaries of the hottest summers, the coldest winters, the flooding, the winds, hardest hit by climate change, first and hardest. And yet they're the least able to recover from all the situations that devastate them. So, you know, we're very concerned about working to uh, get people to turn those lights out. Let me and ask. You can't see the stars. I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, no, no. I'm so sorry. Please continue. You know, I, I have a story to tell. Um, when I was younger, I was very interested in science. I had like uh, uh, all kinds of plants in my bedroom. And, you know, I was really interested. And my mother bought me a telescope once and she ended up taking it back. We thought it was defective because we couldn't see the stars. And I lost interest immediately. I'm like, you know, this is, this, this is just not going to work. But I remember, oh, about 13 years ago when I saw total darkness for the first time, I never realized that I had never seen total darkness. And I was on a cruise. And if you've ever been on a cruise, you notice that when there are other ships in close proximity, you get the light from the, from the other ships and they brighten up the sky. But on this one particular cruise, there were no other ships in the sky. And for the first time in my life, I saw total darkness. And it took a while for me to adjust to that. I stuck my hand out and couldn't even see my hand two feet in front of me. And then I looked up at the sky and I was mesmerized because I actually saw stars, not tiny little dots in the distance. I actually saw stars. And I, I think I sat in that balcony all night long, just looking up. This is something we don't get to see in urban areas. We don't get to see these things in areas that have large amounts of light pollution. And I say pollution because pollution is not a good thing. Pollution is bad. There's too much light. In fact, in the urban areas, they justify the lights by stating that it deters crime. But as we all know, all of our cities are illuminated very brightly and crime has not stopped. In fact, there are numerous studies that show that most crime is done during the day. Yeah, <laughs> you hear about the nighttime crime because that's the sexy part of it. You know, you, you hear about it on the, on the news because it's sexy to find this guy creeping in the dark, you know, in a dark alley. But in reality, most crime occurs in the brightness because criminals have to see too. 
So I, I will stop right there. No, I, I love this. Thank you so much. And I'm going to go, I want to talk to you a little bit more about safety and light pollution. And we, we discussed that a, a little bit, but before yeah. we get to that, you mentioned something, um, the feeling of being in total darkness yeah. and being able to look up at the stars. Now, I want to read this quote, and I'm wondering if this is the feeling that you may have had. Um, this quote says, awe is a difficult emotion to define, but researchers are learning it lifts our mood by shifting our perspectives outward, right? So as opposed to it being just about me, when I get to look up at the stars, it shifts my perspective outward, it makes me feel almost small. And that is kind of, it starts to tap to, okay, that is the awe or the wonder. Is that um, accurate in, in maybe the, the emotion that you were feeling? Obviously, like we said, it's hard to define, but does that, um, is that close to how you're feeling that sense of awe? Well, it was more than that. It was somewhat accurate. What I felt was, you know, I grew up learning that darkness was bad. I grew up learning that, oh my God, I better get back on this into my room because somebody might attack me. But I was more relaxed and felt more comfort in that total darkness than I had ever felt. And to this day, I've never mm. had that comforting feeling in total darkness in a place where I should be afraid. And I wasn't. Mm. Thank you so much. Right on that very uh, thing that you just said about feeling um, the, uh, that feeling that sense of uh, security and darkness. I want to talk a little bit about um, the drinking gourd with Dr. Uh, Anthony Tressa King, uh, who has arranged uh, a piece for my choir, actually. <laughs> uh, it's called, uh, and my choir will be singing it. It's called The Drinking Gourd. Um, but I want to talk to you a little bit about uh, Miss Sharon Lewis mentioned that we were taught that darkness is bad. However, um, some of our ancestors, as we know, really flourished in darkness. Um, so I do want to ask Dr. King, you know, what are your, your, um, your thoughts about the uh, the ancestral sky, enslaved people, the drinking gourd, and how do all of those uh, things find their synergies? Yeah, I mean, as um, Sharon was talking about, uh, Ms. Sharon was talking about earlier that um, it is connected to our people, right? It's this the the from a historical perspective, um, where the the night sky was was leveraged as a way to um, travel. A way to guide us, a way to, uh, and and in back then when you're in an enslaved environment, um, the the idea is to to escape somehow. Let's let's try to relieve ourselves of this of this horrific conditions and this oppressive uh, situation. And how are we going to do that? How are we going to guide ourselves? Um, you're not going to just go down, you know, uh, you know, I ninety three, just kind of. <laughs> hit an interstate and just kind of follow the lights. It's not going to work because as soon as you were, you were seen, you were, you were, you were captured. So you had to travel outside light essentially and travel amongst the stars and use the stars. And, and you, you think about like the drinking gourd itself and, and what it was describing. Um, you know, it, it, it talks specifically about leaving at a, at a, at a certain time during the year where the constellations were aligned and that you follow these constellations, the big dipper, um, you would you'd be heading heading north, um, so the timing was very important um, as as well. So springtime uh, when the the quails were in breeding set season and 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 so on, um, so it was a definite guiding guiding map. But you look at the other cultures around the world, uh, you, uh, you know, in the, in the South Pacific and and how um, the Pacific Islanders were able to kind of traverse on canoes, which is just insane to me, and be able to travel from island to island and then be able to retrace your steps that's impossible without the stars like you they would be lost at sea um so the you know we've we've in a sense uh, through our you know but by, by by becoming urbanized I and mean, there's other reasons why we've disconnected with nature right so it's not just light pollution there's other we are we are fundamentally disconnected with nature um 
but we were losing that sense that 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 piece of us that is connected with nature that is connected with the sky that is connected with um you know the the world that's around us um and that to me is fascinating when i was uh working in boston with the boston children's course we would every year we take kids out of the urban environment and we go out in the middle of nowhere massachusetts and and it would be at night it's on this big campus it's the ron burton training center um and like you'd leave the main building and you're to your point sharon you can't see your hand it's like you will trip <laughs> if, again we had to walk to go like eat so you had to just take this long walk down this windy path just to get to your food and you have all these kids who've never been out in that environment and at first it's it's shocking it's like i i don't like this this is uncomfortable you know uh um but once they get past that initial shock it's they start to feel this this awe and next thing you know they're just hanging out outside at night in the dark we don't know okay it's time to go to bed let's let's get back in um but it's it's that once we immerse ourselves in these environments we we start to tune ourselves back in and i think that's something that we've lost that's something that our our certainly our ancestors um have had um and we're connected with and it's something that uh, i think we should strive all of us everybody should strive to reconnect with nature go on walks get outside um you know just like even think about light pollution its impact on on uh, uh communities of color but the impact on on birds for example um and, and migration routes um the birds use the night sky to to um, navigate or insects i mean that's why insects fly to lights right the 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 idea is that the stars you can never get to them so they can fly in a direction and they'll never get them but now they fly in a direction and they run into a light so they're, they're confused by the lights that we're doing. And so it's doing a lot of damage um, to our environment. I'm actually, I love what you, the last thing you said and, and um, about how, the, well, I don't love the fact that it's doing a lot of damage to our environment, um, but I love the point you brought up. And I'm gonna actually open that up to both Ms. Sharon Lewis and Dr. Hughes to kind of talk about what, how is this affecting how, and I don't think I don't think that we really understand and fully grasp, especially here in the North Hartford community, how this is actually affecting us, Ms. Sharon, right? So can I'm going to open it up to both of you. And, and um, yeah, uh, Dr. TK just said that um, it's really having a large effect on our society and our environment. So would you all like to speak to that? Well, Meredith, I'll have you go first because I've spoken quite a bit. Um, sure. Well, yeah, I, I feel like we, we have talked about it quite a bit, but, you know, I, I guess a couple of things that I'll add. Um, one is I, I just want to emphasize the point that, that Sharon Lewis made a few minutes ago about um, how, how wasteful light pollution is, right? And this is a battle that astronomers are always fighting. Um, you know, it's, it's something that happens at Wesleyan. They put lights, they put new, new campus security lights all over the top of the hill that our observatory is on. And we go, wait a minute, you, you didn't, you, you know, we actually don't need that much light, right? Not only is it harmful to our ability to observe the night sky, but it's wasteful. And, you know, if you just, the, you know, there's studies showing that the glare is actually actually actively uh, working wow. against the goal of security, right? The glare is like the light that shines directly into your eyes, which makes it harder for you to see your surroundings. And so for both safety reasons and, um, you know, astronomical view reasons, you want to direct it down. So we're always fighting that, that battle um, and fighting the wastefulness that goes along with this. Um, and, uh, you know, then I, I think one of the, um, interesting things that I've noticed in my classes over the last number of years is that when I ask students to raise their hand, how many of them have seen the Milky Way before? And this is like something you, you can see it from Connecticut, right? You just have to go to a place that's fairly dark down by the ocean or out in the woods somewhere. And you can actually see the Milky Way in Connecticut. I noticed that it's a shrinking fraction every year. And so, you know, that's to Anthony's point about, um, yeah, it's, it, we are losing touch with nature. We're losing touch with the environment that we find ourselves in. And and what's more, I mean, we're, we're actually losing, I, I think that students find it more difficult to connect with this concept of, uh, Miles, this is something you mentioned, right? This idea that we are part of a larger whole. And there are things that you can see in the night sky that kind of emphasize that you're part of that larger whole. If, you, if you've ever been to a really truly dark sky location, you feel like you're inside the Milky Way, right? You can see that band of the Milky Way stretching all around you. You feel this, this orientation, right? This sense of orientation um, of your place in the universe. 
And another thing that you can see, which probably nobody from Connecticut has seen if you haven't traveled outside of Connecticut is something called the zodiacal light. And in terms of planet formation, this is actually the leftover disk of dust that's that's the plane of our solar system, right? We are sitting inside a dust disk that you can actually see with the naked eye, but it's really hard around here. Um, I've only seen it from Hawaii when I've been observing um, on Mauna Kea before. And so, um, so we're losing that sense of our place in the universe. And I think that sense of our place in the universe is so important. And especially in these, these times of great social unrest and, and disconnection from one another, right? We are so disconnected from one another. The fact that we're even having this conversation on Zoom in the first place, instead of in person together in a room, right? We're losing our sense of connection to one another. We're losing our sense of place in the universe. And I think that's a real, um, it's, it's one of the real tangible benefits of astronomy. You know, astronomy is kind of an odd science. <laughs> It's not like there's an industry component to it. It's not like we're commercializing our ideas here, right? Um, but but just like uh, the musical community, right? I wouldn't want to be part of a society that didn't that didn't um, have have music, right? That didn't have art. And similarly, I wouldn't want to be part of a society where people didn't study the night sky, didn't study our place in the universe, didn't think bigger picture questions than you know like who's who's going to grab what from whom, right? Think about, okay, here we are on this little planet in this vast universe. What is our past? What is our future? What is our place here? And what is our purpose? And those are some of the questions that we lose touch with when we lose touch with the night sky because of the light pollution. I, I certainly agree with you. In fact, uh, one of our main objectives is to abolish those situations which cause the inequities of where people live, work, and play. To me, it is not enough to bring a group of kids to darkness every now and then. They need to understand what it's like 100% of the time every single day. Because every now and then, it, it, it like uh, plays into the excuses for why things can't be equal. So we do our NABDIS to eliminate things like light pollution, to make sure that there are open spaces for children, and I often use my story about the telescope and the kids often laugh, but I say, you know, it was a real, it was a reality for us. Um, I don't know where it was. I think in 94, there was an earthquake somewhere in America where people called, uh, 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 I forget the name of the, 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 the area, this conservatory or whatever, because they saw the Milky Way and didn't know what it was. Total darkness. And they're like, oh my God, is this like aliens from Mars? You know, they were really scared. Like, what the hell is this? They'd never seen it before. And once uh, I find children and even adults actually see the darkness, they tend to love it. Because, you know, we also teach them that the light pollution destroys the total ecology, which is a part of our life too. So when you talk about the birds and the insects and the bees, especially, you know, where they don't, a lot of bees pollinate at night, but if there's too much bright light, they don't pollinate. And you wonder why we're losing millions of bees every single year and the lack of pollination, as you know, produces the lack of production. So, you know, it's, um, it, it's, it's something that we strive for in addition to, you know, having people enjoy clean air, clean water and uncontaminated land we try our damnedest to make people understand that light pollution is just as dangerous as all the other types of pollution. But that's on that's unusual. Sorry, Miles, I'm totally taking over your job. <laughs> you know what I mean? Ms. Sharon, that's unusual. Um, most people don't think of light pollution. They'll get the yeah. air, they'll get the water, yeah. the land, but it's the, the light pollution, the night sky is outside of the bound of thinking. And so it's about bringing awareness to yeah, we a, do it all. a greater. Even, even noise pollution, people don't think about. Yes, right. You know, and right. I passed a noise pollution ordinance in the city of Hartford at the risk of my life because so many people were against me for just that. And I'm sure now I'm gonna catch hell trying to pass light pollution and ordinances in Hartford too. And oh, nobody cares, you. nobody understands, but it's, it's an uphill battle. I'm voting for you. Miss Sharon, Miss Sharon, quick question. How can we help and, and, and how can folks get involved to help you in this process? Well, one of the things, well, that's a really good question. Um, <clears throat> when people ask me this question, I often say to them, they like to throw money at me, which I will accept all the time. 
Don't think I won't. But what I want you to do is to use your privilege to help, you know, use your privilege no matter where you are. And instead of saying to people, I can't believe he did that, walk up to that person and say, I can't believe you did that. If we do enough of that, then that'll go a long way toward creating change. Another thing is to practice what you preach. Turn those lights off. I remember my mother used to go nuts when we'd leave a light on in the house. You know, what I tend to do now is have all these automatic light sensors. When I leave a room, the light will go off automatically after a few minutes. You know, not everybody can afford those, but we can all practice, uh, um, I, I call good light etiquette. Turn those lights off. And, you know, we really don't need those bright monitors that we use, you know, find some type of warm lighting. Um, I am used to be a real bad person when I had several TVs on at one time, several <laughs> lights on it. I'm looking now at the light in the bathroom. I'm not even in the bathroom. So, <laughs> you know, we just need to practice what we preach and then talk to people about, you know, for example, when uh, cities and towns and municipalities are voting on how much money to spend on lighting up a, uh, a park or lighting up a street. Be there and testify against spending that amount of money. Be there and state that there's other ways to spend this money and explain how what a waste of energy all these extra light bulbs and all this extra brightness is. And it's a waste of human health and the environment as well. You know, like I say, I connect it to climate change all the time. And that's how people get it. Because, you know, fossil fuels are still the main source of energy in America. And fossil fuels are the ones that hurt people of color and communities the worst and hit us the hardest. So when you connect it to something that people understand, that's when they'll really get the message. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, you mentioned that, and uh, across the board, we've all mentioned that many of us are unaware of um, these issues. And I can speak for the North Hartford community and say that I, I was unaware of a lot of the issues that affect me, um, which I'm very upset about, but excited to learn from you all. Um, the reason I think part, part of the issue and part of the disconnect is our access to programs like an, like an astronomy program at Wesleyan. And so what I wanna do is ask Dr. Meredith, you know, you mentioned that the access to, uh, or the access for women or people of color, uh, people in urban communities, it's really hard for them to break into the astronomy field. And, and, and that is, to me is saying why we don't really know about some of these issues. So can you talk about um, your observances around um, people of color and uh, women in those in the STEM fields? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, you know, there are a lot of different demographic groups that are underrepresented in the field of astronomy. And just to kind of name a few, I mean, you've, you've mentioned most of them, but um, but white women, people of color, people with disabilities, um, people who are on the LGBTIQA continuum, um, low income and first generation um, people, all of those people are underrepresented in the field of astronomy. And, um, and I also want to mention that it's very intersectional, right? If you happen to have multiple of those identities, you kind of get the double or triple whammy, um, and it's not the same as being part of, of one group or another. Um, some of the, uh, you know, we talk a lot about, in, in astronomy, we talk a lot about how do we, how do we change this, and where are these problems coming from, and we get some clues from the field of sociology. Um, a lot of, uh, you know, some of the, you know, there, there's so many reasons, right? There's who gets to walk in the door of Wesleyan in the first place, right? And it's not just Wesleyan, it's any place with an astronomy degree program. There are all kinds of inequities in the educational system at the K through 12 level, and even before that, right? In the pre, in who has access to high quality pre-K programs. Um, but even once you're in the door, right, that's not even enough. And some of the things that really happen at the college level are things like, um, so I'll just mention a few of these sociological studies that look at some of the barriers that people face even once they have gotten uh, through the door and they're in a physics or astronomy program. One is um, 
looking at people's beliefs about the field and how that impacts diversity within the field. So there was this really interesting study where they looked at something called a field specific ability belief. So they basically went and asked um, faculty and PhDs in the field, do you think you have to be a genius to do this, right? That's, that's effectively what they asked. And so um, in physics, the answer was yes, you have to be a genius to do physics. Whereas in astronomy, the answer is well, you know, maybe a little bit of natural ability is necessary, but, you know, maybe also a lot of hard work and things like that. And basically they looked at field specific ability beliefs for a lot of fields, and they correlated that with a fraction of women and people of color in the field. And it was a total negative correlation. The more people believe that you have to be a genius to succeed in that field, the fewer women and people of color there are in that field, right? And I don't think that should surprise any of us. Another thing that is really disturbing is that, um, there was another interesting study where a sociological researcher sent emails to faculty working in the field and changed the names so that they were uh, either stereotypically male, female, or from different ethnicities and looked at how likely that professor was to respond to a request for a meeting within the next you know, day or the next week. And um, the answer, as I'm sure you're not surprised to hear, right, is that the responses to women and people of color um, were, uh, were a lot less welcoming. <laughs> Um, and then Maybe finally, sure. yeah, right, right. And then finally, um, another one is uh, they, you know, it's one of these classic resume switching studies where they change the names on the resume. And, um, but, you know, one of the things that's notable about this study is that it was actually done on science faculty. Um, and then they asked these faculty to rate um, the applicants for this lab manager position and looked at, and then asked them, okay, what salary, what starting salary would you offer this person? And how likely would you be to mentor this person? And there were both race and gender differences on those axes as well. So we get a lot of, um, even once people are in the door, right, even once they have this ability to, uh, to succeed in, in the classwork, they're, um, they're still facing a headwind. And um, so, you know, we like to talk a lot about implicit bias, stereotype threat, those are some of the buzzwords that go along with these things. But the answer, but the answer truly is that it's, it's really um, a multivariable problem, that there are a lot of different factors. Um, and, you know, one of my favorite quotes is uh, Virginia Valian wrote this book. Um, about, you know, uh, why, why so slow the advancement of women. And, and she has this great quote that um, mountains are molehills piled on top of one another, right? It's all of these, these relatively small things, um, a discouragement, a, a lack of reply to an email, something like that, right, that adds up to keep people out of the field. So, um, so that's like my, you know, two minute answer to why this exists, but you know, I, I, it's a huge topic that we could talk about forever. Um, but I really do want to emphasize the intersectional nature of it and the fact that um, people's experiences individually are very different. And, you know, even just looking at our observatory at Wesleyan, um, only in the last few years, do we even have uh, ramps that allow people to come into the building, right? It's a historical building. So we were kind of grandfathered in with the ADA and only recently has it been retrofitted to even allow people with disabilities who need mobility aids to make their way into our building. So there, there are so many different factors involved and, um, and we lose talent when this happens. This is the other thing that I really want to emphasize is that talent is not correlated with any of those identity axes, right? And so if we're disproportionately discouraging certain groups from entering the field, our science is not going to be as good. Um, it's not. It's not only an equity issue. I mean, it is obviously an equity issue, and that's important too. Just the ethical issue itself, but it's also an issue of it. It hurts the science that we're able to do. It hurts our ability to learn about the universe actively. Okay, thank you so much. I'm I'm busy writing because I'm taking notes and trying to moderate at the same time. <laughs> um, Dr. TK, uh, that was a little. I'm happy that we got to delve into some of the issues around STEM fields. I want to talk about STEAM um, and how we deal with some of the same inequities and access issues. Um, and one point that Dr. Meredith Hughes really pointed out that I loved was she said, we lose talent. Um, and so Dr. TK, I'd like you to kind of talk about your experiences in the STEAM fields and where are the inequities and, and barriers uh, there? Yeah, I, 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 I could just repeat everything that Meredith said um, for, for, for the arts and, and particularly in leadership positions and just go, um, you know, when I was uh, coming up, somebody pulled me aside and said, have you ever seen anybody who looks like you uh, conducting? And my answer was no, I hadn't. And I was, a, I was a sophomore in college at that time. 
it's a long time to kind of experience that. Um, uh, and and I, I went to school to study engineering and music, so I double majored in both. Um, and, and I love physics. Physics was great. It was amazing. And there were some parallels that went along with physics and music. Um, particularly, to, in order to be great at physics um, or sciences, you have to know how to practice. And, and taking the practice skills that we learned as musicians and just applying it to the physics. Because we had this calc-based physics course. Sorry, this is a, a weird tangent. But just what, but as a calc-based physics course, in which we had to derive all of our, our equations using calculus to then solve the question for the tests. Um, so you, it was really interesting. And so you just practice, you just practice. And I would finish the test in about 15 minutes because I knew how to practice. Everybody else would take them a couple hours. And finally, the professor looked me up and, and, and said, you know, he thought I was going to fail because I was finishing so quickly, he thought I'd just quit. But when I was getting A's, and he looked, he said, oh, you're a musician. Okay, now this makes sense. Like all of it makes sense to him. Um, so there is, there is this talent that if you're not, if we're not constantly encouraged, and I was fortunate that I was encouraged, um, that uh, there is a headwind. And I've faced many a headwind. In fact, when I was, uh, uh, began my, my teaching career, my, my professional career, someone said the only reason I was where I was was because I was black. And that plants a seed in your head that makes you think, I'm not good enough. Maybe that's their right, and I'm, I'm just being tokenized, and I'm being put in this position, and I actually don't have any talent. Um, and, and too many of the time, you know, and that's, and I, and I actually overcame that, obviously, and, and well, I, we'll see if I have. But, I, you know, I'm doing what I can to, to try and encourage other people, but yeah, that, that headwind is, is certainly real, and it is little things. It's these little things that add up. It's when you sit on stage, and you look around you, and you realize nobody looks like you, right? It's when you're in class, and you look around you, there's nobody like you. Um, and it's not just for people of color, it's, it's for gender identity. It's, there's all these, these things where you, you, you run into um, uh, these barriers and they're just little barriers that get in the way of, 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 of success and being successful. So I think that's where we, can, we come in and we have to be aware of that and do what we can to, to kind of counteract that, to encourage people, to, to have conversations. Um, I had a singer in my office the other day who was like, you know what, I, I, she's, she's a freshman. She's like, I really want to sing in your chorus because I've never had a conductor that looks like me. I said, you, you're going to be in my chorus. Don't worry about it. We'll, we'll get you in the chorus and I want you to have that experience because I think it's really important for you to have that experience to be around people in leadership positions that look like the people who you are. And the sciences are, are a huge thing. I mean, think, you know, it's thankful we have Neil, Neil deGrasse Tyson, right, who's out there being a person who we can, we can look towards in, in the black community. Uh, but we need more representatives uh, um, in, 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 to be in all different areas uh, that we can point to and say, that's, that's who you can be. It's like, you know, the reason that President Obama was so important, and it doesn't matter your political, um, where your ideology falls, having a black president is really important. <laughs> it just is. Because it means all of a sudden at this moment, if you're black, you can be president. Whereas before that, you couldn't. Um, and we look at the Supreme Court justice, um, you know, now and in and, and all these positions, it's just wildly, wildly important. And the other thing, and I'll just quickly segue and then I'll shut up. Music in the arts is a great way to bring attention to all of these specific issues. Um, you know, because we like to think intellectually, but sometimes people want to be entertained. They want to be, they want to go to something and they just want to have something that's entertaining. They want to be impacted emotionally. Well, that's where music and the arts can come in. It connects with our emotions, but if you sneak some some learning in with that emotional connection some awareness in with it um then all of a sudden people go oh wait a minute i never thought about that you know to bring light pollution into a concert like that how many of us has gone to a concert where light pollution has been one of the things we right exactly so it, it it's it's bringing these issues up and saying here you go and and let's address it in an artistic form um and so the concert that we have coming up next week, we're talking about all about the sky. The number of songs that we have, about, it was a hard thing to program. I know Sarah knows. We're like, how? geez, we got to find different pieces about the stars. Like, <laughs> you know, a whole concert. This is crazy. Um, but, but we did. And, and um, you know, it's, when you leave that experience, you're going you're gonna to think about the world differently. And it's not for us as artists to provide answers. That's why we have Dr. Hughes on the panel. That's why we have Miss Lewis on the panel to provide, help us with the answers. It's us to help us find the questions and plant those questions in your heads. So when you leave, you go, I've never thought about that. I'm going to think about it deeper. 
So that's that's ultimately my goal. If, if I may just make a comment, I want to thank you for everything you've just said. And I'd like to also just mention that we do our best to level the playing field. When I was in college, a lot of people walked up to me and said the same thing. You're only here because of affirmative action. And I was taught to tell people, you're only here because of the privileges that you had as a, I went to an all girls college, Mount Holyoke College. You're only here because of the privileges you had as a white girl. And also you could possibly be here because your daddy gave a hundred thousand dollars to the school. So it looks like we're both in the same boat. And that just levels the playing field and people stop talking about that. But I also wanna make a comment about your uh, emotions uh, comment when it comes to music. We do everything we can and use every trick in the book to educate people. You know, some people are not direct learners. Some people don't learn by reading. They learn by being exposed to things. They learn by the theater. They learn by music. But it's that emotional piece that makes people retain the information. So we will go emotion each and every time. In fact, after this call, I'm looking forward to connecting with all three of you to help us. I'm a member of the Climate Justice Alliance, which is a huge group of environmental organizations fighting climate justice in the United States and the world. And the Black Caucus is planning a Juneteenth celebration. And I would love to have all three of you work with us to develop some dynamic, emotional, whatever, to go along with our Juneteenth uh, presentation. So I'm gonna shut up too, because I've spoken too much. You guys have to stop saying, I'm gonna shut up, man. You guys, <laughs> this information is so amazing. Um, I just wanna thank you so much. And um, uh, this kind of brings us to why we're here, right? We're using music uh, as a conduit uh, to, like Dr. TK said, um, spark some questions, um, get you to think deeper and to break down the, the barriers that we naturally have as people, right? We, we set up these barriers um, and, and we have these cultural identities and what music does is it kind of blurs the lines, right? Between, and then, you know, because of, because we have these, you know, preconceived notions, what music does is it challenges us. It challenges us and it breaks down those barriers that other things might not be able to, like say in a classroom. But when you're listening to music, like Dr. TK said, and then you just sneak a little um, informative uh, or some information in there, oh, now, I'm open and I'm ready to receive that information. Um, so I really want to not only uh, emphasize that, but thank Sarah um, for her work in putting this together uh, and, and understanding that music can be a tool uh, to, to move this conversation forward and to get some action, action items down on the list as well as to how to move forward with, with Ms. Sharon Lewis. <laughs> So, uh, you know, I'm going to break the rules just a tad really quickly, and I'm going to ask Sarah really quickly if you could talk just uh, about um, how music for you and how, how this, uh, this concert, what was, your, what was your, um, your process in developing this concert and, and why? Well, it actually started because of COVID. So pre-COVID, we had planned to do a concert called Woven Skies and kind of that concept of looking up as a way to remind us of our shared humanity. So we were planning this back in 2019. We were going to um, collaborate with a couple planetariums and sing sort of under those artificial stars within that environment. Well, COVID sort of um, put the kibosh on that plan. So what we ended up doing was we started, you know, trying to perform outside. And I thought, gosh, what if we could perform outside underneath the stars? How incredible would that be? Um, and then I started thinking about it and I thought, well, not everyone feels they have equal access to being outside in the dark. You know, women oftentimes don't feel very safe in those communities and especially communities of color have been, um, either completely barred like from the national parks uh, many years ago, or just it hasn't in the culture like many of you have already spoken about. And so that's what's 
kind of set the spark for this concert was this idea of we need to talk about this um, and really kind of explore what are these barriers and, and what is keeping um, the night sky from being accessible to everyone. Um, and I mean, I grew up in Los Angeles, so I couldn't see anything. Um, in fact, the video that uh, Anthony posted, the very first thing that comes up, it says there was an earthquake in 1994. And everyone and everyone lost power in, in downtown Los Angeles and people called because they were seeing that they didn't know what was up in the night sky. Well, I lived through that earthquake um, and I probably didn't go outside at night because I was too afraid to be outside in complete darkness. So there's so many different things that um, really pushed us toward this concert. But the main thing is let's use music as a way to explore this concept, this idea, um, because how often have, as choral musicians, we've sung about stars and um, falling in love underneath a, you know, starlit sky and all of these connections that we've had. And um, it just makes me sad to think that, first of all, we're losing that ancestral sky with those mega constellations that um, Dr. Hughes talked about. And um, just that not everyone has that same chance. So this is just a conversation starter. Let's let's start talking about it. Let's see what we can do next. And of course, the equity um, piece that is uh, connected to uh, being able to see the night sky, I also see that in STEM, and I've experienced that as well in uh, choral music, being a female conductor. So I was like, these are all connected, even though no one would say astronomy. <laughs> astronomy the outdoors and music have some connection but they do and so we're starting that conversation and let's see what we can do with these three connections and make, move forward and create something pretty incredible thank you everyone so much for your uh, willingness to have this discussion and have this uh, conversation i am better a lot better because I had this conversation and I am going to go back to my community and um really ra raise a fuss um about about light pollution um and safety and miss sharon we, we got a lot of conversations to have <laughs> but uh and doc, i mean dr meredith too i want my kids to be out there at the observatory um and then you know tk i'll sing with you sometime <laughs> but i am just so honored and for the last uh, few moments what i'll do is we'll do this quickly what i'd like to do is have uh each of the panelists give their last maybe one or two minutes uh, of a uh, closing remarks. And then we're gonna open it up to uh, the audience and see if anyone has any questions for us, okay? So uh, we'll start with Dr. Meredith Hughes. Um, sure, oh, my last one to two minutes of thoughts. I don't know, there's so much to think about from everything that everyone has said. Um, I guess I'll, I'll just close with saying that I'm really excited about the concert next week. And, um, and you know, I love, I've loved the opportunity to talk about these connections between music and astronomy, which I think are, are very natural to me to see, actually. I, I use music um, before each of my classes. I usually play a piece of music that has some connection with astronomy. Um, everything from like a Josquin setting of Ave Maria that talks about Lucifer Lux Oriens. Like, where does that come from? The idea that Lucifer was the was actually the morning star in some sense and was Venus. So so how did that imagery connect to the geometry of our solar system, for example? Um, and then, you know, I, I, I used to play Carillon also like bells in a bell tower, right? And and the um so I was playing care. I learned to play Carillon in college, and then I did my uh, my undergraduate thesis work on um, astro seismology, which is basically about the sound waves that travel around stars that tell us about their internal structure. And they're very similar in the way that they have nodes um, to the sound waves that that travel around the surface of a bell. Um, so uh, so I I just I love this connection between astronomy and music, and I'm so glad. Um, that Sarah has had the vision to extend this into um, questions about equity and access both to music and the night sky, right? Because um, astronomy and music, I think, are very uh, naturally intertwined. And then this issue of equity and access and who gets to do astronomy and who gets to do music and um, and why, right? These questions are, are, I think, really naturally connected to one another. But I think it's brilliant that you've brought them together in this way for the concert. So I'm really excited about it. Dr. TK? 
Uh, yeah, no, I don't have any really <laughs> wise <laughs> final thoughts. I'm just um, honored to be here and, and to, to be able to talk about this this topic and to, to contribute to it. Um, I did post a couple things in the chat. Um, you know, there's a video on light pollution. Uh, full disclosure, uh, my partner is listening and she's feeding me all this information because again, that's it's it's in her wheelhouse. Uh, so the dark sky compliant lighting uh, thing, and we actually did install at our house. Um, we installed out all dark sky um, compliant lighting on the outside of our house, um, and it wasn't. It didn't take very long. It's just kind of a couple different things. You can just go on to Amazon or wherever you can go to there, and you can get dark sky compliant lighting, and it changes your own yard actually. Not a, not all of a sudden you have this this glare that Dr. Hughes was talking about. Everything is very focused on the specific area and lighting what needs to be lit and that's it so it's it's great but anyway looking forward to the concert thank you so much well, miss sharon I, I just ditto everything uh the two of you have just said uh, i will just end it by stating that light pollution is a total waste of energy and we need to understand it as such we need to think about greenhouse gases and we need to think about climate change because once again, and I can't say this often enough, fossil fuels are still the main source of energy in America, and we need to shut fossil fuel industry down. And shutting off the lights and, and, and finding uh, alternatives to lights like the dark skies would be a great way, a good step forward in eliminating another source of pollution. Thank you for challenging us and everyone. I, I just really appreciate your comments. Um, any, any commentary or questions from the audience? Feel free to go ahead and raise your hand on the, uh, um, uh, what do you call it? Or you can just place it in the chat. Uh, if you'd like to just type some your questions in the chat, we're more than welcome to uh, hear what you have to say. While you're waiting, uh, Dr. TK has said he would sing us um, Drinking Gourd. Oh, I'm sorry, what? <laughs> follow the drinking gourd. Follow the drinking gourd. All right, now if you want to hear more, April 9th, 7 <laughs> Charter of Oaks. <laughs> I'll see you there. <laughs> Anyone have any questions? Uh, Okay, well, listen, yeah, absolutely. We'll, I'll give you five, a couple more minutes because I don't want to cut anyone off. While we're doing that, Sarah, do you have any concert information you'd like to share with us uh, prior to April 9th? Absolutely. All you have to do is go to our website at uh, consonari-sing.org. Oh, here, I'll put it in the chat. That is a great idea. Um, you can go ahead and uh, get a ticket there. Now they're $15 um, for the performance, but of course, anyone who has, um, who can't afford $15 can easily come without that. So there is a, a free option because we always want our concerts to be accessible to everyone, regardless of financial um, status or situation. And we will be at uh, Charter Oak and uh, parking for Charter Oak is directly across the street. Um, in downtown Hartford, and it's going to be a fantastic performance. I just, I cannot wait, and I'm really um, looking forward to it. And we will talk a little bit about some of the things we talked about tonight through the programming, so look forward to that. I'm hoping someone has a question. Yeah. I mean, you gotta have a question for Dr. Hughes, right? I know. I, do. <laughs> I did, I do too, actually. <laughs> I know, I totally have questions. <laughs> I know. Okay. Wait a minute, let's do an inter inter panel while we wait. We'll do an inter panel question. <laughs> so so Dr. TK, you had a question for Dr. Meredith? <laughs> yeah, so this planetary formation, that is cool. <laughs> like in 30 seconds, like distilled like what that actually is, like how you like I, I don't even know how, what questions to ask. I just know it sounds really cool. You guys are too funny. Um, so uh, 30 seconds. All right, ready? Giant clouds of gas and dust in space. Gravity pulls them together. They're spinning just a little bit. So like a figure skater who pulls in her arms, they spin faster and faster and faster as they get smaller. And what happens when you have something sticky that you spin? You make a pizza, flattened pizza, 
that plane is the plane of our solar system. And so the flattened disk of gas and dust that's left over from the formation of the star is then the birthplace of the planets. And that's why our solar system is flat. That's why all of the planets orbit around the sun in the same direction. That's why they almost all rotate in the same direction. And, you know, we just have to work out the details. <laughs> that's, that's the 30 second version. <laughs> no, but that was brilliant because I understand the universe way differently now because of I'm that so 30 bad. seconds. <laughs> wow. Hey, I have a personal question for Ms. Sharon. What, now I do sit in on the meetings uh, at the community and at the community, they're always like, we need more lights, right? They're always like, we need more lights, more lights, more lights. Well, how do we combat that? Well, you, first of all, you say the, the, the crime statistics that you think you need lights for are not going to decrease with more lights. They have not, and studies have shown that they haven't. And when you break out the statistics about the daytime uh, break-ins to people's homes, the, the daytime shootings, which have been unbelievably outrageous. Yeah. You know, my husband and I are licensed firearms carriers, and we were at the range one day on a Saturday, and we came home, and I wanted to put my weapon up. And he said, what are you doing? He said, uh, this is only 11 o'clock. I said, yeah. He says, most crimes occur before noon. So it's, it's going to be in the 12 o'clock news. So, and believe it or not, that very same day, like moments after he said that, this guy drove this out of control car into my driveway, almost hit my car and accosted me. Thank God my husband was there. But this was 11 o'clock on a Saturday afternoon. So you need to tell people, you know, look at the statistics. Yeah. You need more light for what? Yeah. Who's out there? Because what you're doing is you're illuminating the situations for the criminals. You're letting them know, here, this is my backyard. Look how bright and beautiful it is. And by the way, my lawnmower is out there. You can take that too. Mm -hmm. That's what you're doing. Mm -hmm. They're great community models too. Tucson, Arizona is a real model in terms of handling light pollution on a city level. Um, you know, even just changing the types of lights you use, right? Like there are all of these sodium vapor lights that have a really broad spectrum. Replacing those with LEDs means you get the same amount of security for a fraction of the energy costs, right? There, um, we have other places that we can look to for examples of sensible light pollution policy. And astronomers have been really active in pushing for light pollution control in, in Tucson, Arizona, because of course that's near Kitt Peak National Observatory. Um, so, so examples exist and we just need to use the models that are already out out there. But there's also another thing you should say at these meetings and people don't understand. It's not the lighting, it's the police response. Word. I've lived in the north end of Hartford my entire life. 16 years ago, somebody hit my truck and his license plate fell off. I'm still waiting for the police. And, and just recently I called the police and they're telling me, well, you know, there's an event going on at the Meadows, so I can't get to you tonight. Yeah. So it's the police response. It's not the lights. I agree a hundred percent. So um, there's so many, uh, so many connecting ways to this conversation, but I, I did want to talk about or ask uh, Dr. Hughes about those mega constellations. What do those really hinder? Um, not just from us down here, but from astronomers being able to see deep space. Yeah, that's a whole big topic. Um, I'll, again, I'll try to condense it down, but uh, yeah, I mean, you know, nominally they love to make it, they actually love to make equity arguments for the mega constellations. Um, they like to say, oh, we're bringing internet access to the world, right? But there's actually an economic analysis of the cost of satellite internet access and who's going to be able to afford it. And I bet you can guess who's not going to be able to afford access to the internet through these satellite mega constellations, right? Um, but then, so, you know, there's, there's the visible night sky, right? These mega constellations are incredibly bright. I knew that, um, I mean, 
mean, I knew that it was coming, but I realized that it was already here when one of my cousins who lives, you know, in uh, north of Boston posted a picture from her porch of like, what are these streams of lights that I can see going up into the sky, right? She took a video of this string of lights going up into the sky and she had no idea what it was. And I was like, that is a satellite mega constellation launching and get used to it because we're only seeing the very tip of the iceberg in terms of, um, you know, they're putting thousands up um, all the time, right? They're, they're launching them in these like fleets of thousands. And so it's going to change how we see the night sky. It's going to change um, our ability to do radio astronomy because they communicate in the radio spectrum. So, um, so it's going it, to, with, with uh, RFI radio frequency interference, right now we have protected areas of the United States. We have radio, national radio quiet zones in West Virginia and in New Mexico. And, um, and you know, you can't get away from uh, radio emissions that are, that are overhead constantly, right, in these satellite mega constellations. So uh, all of our efforts to protect the radio part of the spectrum for science are going to be made a whole lot more difficult by these um, mega constellations. And, uh, you know, there's, um, there's also the, the question of, of kind of the debris that's going to wind up in low Earth orbit. You know, some of the companies have plans for deorbiting their satellites after they've passed their nominal lifetime. Other companies don't, right? It's voluntary. Nobody's enforcing this. And um, we actually don't know whether it's going to work, right? All it will take, there, we've never had this many things in low Earth orbit before that can potentially collide with one another. And when things collide in low Earth orbit, they create showers of debris that each become their own projectile going off in a different direction. And so ultimately this could potentially limit our access to low earth orbit, both in terms of telecommunications, right? Our ability to launch more satellites that could be destroyed by the debris in low earth orbit, and also to do human exploration of space. So will we even be able to send people up to the International Space Station as it gets more and more dangerous in low earth orbit? We don't have technology for cleaning up low earth orbit. We simply don't. And it's yet another example of the way that people leap before they look, right? Um, companies are doing this because nobody has told them they can and uh, we don't have a plan for how to regulate it, how to clean it up. Um, and so it's a story that's repeated itself throughout human history, right? And we all know who's going to bear the costs. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you all so much. Uh, if no one has any more questions, uh, I, I am just so... I feel like I went into a, a master class as this is a classroom. I don't know about anybody else, but this has felt like a classroom for me. So I'm just really inspired. Um, and thank you, Ms. Sharon. I'm going to be giving the folks of the community a whole bunch of help. <laughs> Listen, friends, uh, enjoy your evening. And thank you so much. Uh, special thank yous to Dr. Meredith, uh, Dr. TK, and Ms. Sharon. Um, we want to thank Sarah and uh, Consonade for uh, having this discussion. And we also want to thank Charter Oak Cultural Center for uh, facilitating this. Listen, friends, go turn off your lights and listen to the drinking gourd arranged by Dr. TK. <laughs> I will see you April 9th for our concert, and I cannot wait to see you there. Good evening. Thank you all so very much. I This was fantastic. I just wrote like pretty much a whole book of notes. So just thank you. I really appreciate thank you all. it. All right. Thank you. Thank you all. Good night. Good night. Thank you, Donna.